made permission. That's where we've been living in the whole month of June. We've been talking about how mission is a big part of who we are, what God has called us to. I mean, we've had the opportunity this month to celebrate with Peter and Kathy Ignatius from India, Lakeview Bible College. What an incredible mission that we're able to stand behind, to move with. We heard their call. We met their need. And God is using us in a powerful way. Today, you'll hear some more opportunities that we get to step into in local missions. But missions has become a big part of who we are. And wouldn't you say that it's a great vision for a church to have missions at the center of it? Wouldn't you say it? It is good. And it is good to have missions there. But I want to tell you something this morning. Missions is not the ultimate goal for the church. It's worship. If worship was in place, there would be no call to missions because all would be worshiping God. But we know that there is a need. And we know that ultimately we want to bring people through mission to a point of worship. Church, we had an incredible worship this morning. Amen? Amen. And God has ushered us in. Are we ready to receive what he has to give to us today? But you think about missions. It can be defined by a lot of different things. Here's one definition of mission. It was given by a, a man named Matthew Paris. He's a Sunday Times journalist. He said it this way. Mission, a person who is by their own confession not a Christian. So if we just think about that, it kind of opens the door to all realms of life, doesn't it? Not just overseas, not just in the Appalachians in Kentucky, or wherever we deem a mission. If we understand the need, which is those to come to an understanding of who Christ is, then we go. But you know, as we walk through this this morning, it's entitled, Don't Miss Your Mission. I think it's important that we take a little moment this morning to kind of get a right perspective, a healthy perspective of what this mission really is that is before us. I'm going to share some statistics with you that will probably give us a very sobering perspective in all of this. Americans, Americans give $700 million a year to mission agencies. And you look at that and you say, man, that's, that's a pretty good investment, $700 million into missions. And it would be easy for us to say, yeah, we're part of that. That's a good thing. But when you think about the other side of this, it says, however, they pay as much for pet food that $700 Hundred million every 3.65 days. Meaning that in the course of a year, we may spend 700 million on missions, but we also spend 70 billion on pet food every year in America. A hundredfold. Now, I love my pet. I do. But it's not in comparison to the lost ever in the perspective of God's eyes. When you think about what's in front of us, there's 7.3 billion people in the world. And I'm grabbing these statistics from what's called the Joshua Project. You can look this up. On the other side of that, there's 900 million pets estimated worldwide. So we can see that there's a lot more people that we have to tend to. And when you think of that 7.3 billion, some of the statistics break it down this way. 2.3 billion of those 7.3 are what's called Christians. And that's kind of a perspective that's kind of widespread, meaning that they'll acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, okay? They'll call, classify that as Christian. Then it breaks down into, you know, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, and all the like. So we see that we have possibly 2.3 billion people that would jump on board in this mission. But it also tells us in the statistics, 7.3 people in the, in the world, 3 billion live among unreached people groups. And 1.6 billion are completely unevangelized. It goes on to say that it complicates this by saying that there's over 6,500 languages worldwide. Try to break into that. And it also tells us in these statistics in AD 100, now listen to this one, there was 12 unreached people groups per congregation of believers. Today there is one unreached people group for every thousand 
congregations, and we're still not getting it done. You see the problem? We have more people to influence the world, but less impact as there once was. It goes on to say, despite Christ's command to evangelize, 67% of all humans from 8030 to present day have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. It goes on to say, 91% of all Christian outreach and evangelism does not target the non-Christian, but other Christians. Challenging. It says in the last 40 years, over 1 billion people have died who have never heard the name Jesus. And in fact, it says that there will be 30 million people this year that never hear the message of salvation. 30 million this year will die without Christ. But then it goes on. It says Christians, that 2.3, make up 33% of the world's population. It says it receives 53% of the world's annual income and spends 98% on themselves. It's heartening, isn't it, when there's a great mission in front of us? But the encouraging thing is this. We don't want to be a statistic, do we? You've heard that before at TLC. And it's, it is so good to be able to tell you today that, you know, we budget every year 10% of our budget towards missions. But we haven't stopped there, have we? We've heard the need. And between our budget numbers, that 10% that we set aside for missions, and all that have stepped in and stepped up to the plate with Lakeview and others, this year alone, TLC is positioned to give over $83,000 into missions this year. Is that not amazing? That marks over 22% of our budget being given back to missions. And statistics will show that most churches never reach even 10%. Now, that's not to say that we've arrived, is it? It's telling us that there is billions of people that still need the Lord. There's a mission that stands before us. In fact, this last statistic tells me that there will still be 160,000 people that will be martyred this year because of their belief in Christ. Still this day. Out of sight, out of mind, right? But yet we have to hear this truth. And you know, this mission that we're talking about, it didn't just happen. It didn't just show up. This has been a problem from the very beginning. But from the very beginning, we know that God had a plan to redeem those that were lost. Through his son, Jesus. But hear me, also through us. God wants us to be part of the plan of redemption. We know that Jesus is the one who saves. But who's to bring forth the message of Jesus? We are. We're to be part of that mission. But sadly... As we look at the statistics, it doesn't tell us that we're buying into that, do we? It doesn't show us that we're stepping into this mission. There may be more Christians than there ever has been, but less impact than there ever has been. Why is that? Because we don't see the invitation that Christ has given to each of us to step into this incredible mission to change the world, to know why, finally, why I exist and what my purpose in life is, Jesus has given it to us. But unfortunately, many of us do not want to hear that truth. Because you know what? That truth often doesn't line up with our life plan. It doesn't fit where I'm going in my life. So we disregard it. We hope that somebody else will take care of that mission. Let me ask you this. Have you ever had a time in your life when your world got turned upside down? I think we all know about that moment. And what do we do? Find ourselves trying to figure out what is next. What is next? What do we do with this moment? You know, Jesus' greatest desire is to step into that moment and radically change your life. But the problem is when we see this, too many of us don't want to face that change that Jesus wants to bring. I mean, we're good with what Jesus can do for us, what he can provide for us. But when we have to deal with the reality that he's calling me to change my life, my position of my life, no, that's not so easy, is it? But that is the mission that is before us. So what were you doing when Jesus showed up in your life? What were you doing when Jesus showed up? And I want us to begin at the very beginning of this whole invitation. Now, you're going to be thinking about when did Jesus show up? Well, I want to make sure that you realize that 
He didn't just show up in the New Testament. In fact, when we go back to Genesis, we see that God, in this plan of redemption, when man had fallen, he, he said, well, before all of this happens, let's, let's create them. Let us create them in our image. Did you catch that? Us. The us is Jesus. So many people think that Jesus showed up when he was born as a baby. Jesus has always been at the side of God. And he was there at the moment of creation. He was there when that breath was brought into Adam's life. He was there. He was orchestrating all of this. Let us create them in our image. So when Adam and Eve came on the scene, when he breathed life into them, God wanted nothing more than to have this wonderful personal relationship. He wanted to walk with them and talk with them in this perfect garden of Eden. And they had that opportunity. But they were also given a choice, weren't they? It's that thing called free will. They were given a choice. And because of that choice that they were given, we stand now in the mission that is before us. The possibility of life eternally apart from God without Jesus. Sin entered the world through Adam and Eve. And they made that choice to live in it. They bought into the lie that was given to them. Satan came up and he says, hey, you know, God's just jealous. He's just jealous. He's just afraid that you may find out that if you eat from this tree that you may know what he knows. You may be able to do what he can do. And they bought into it because we are a selfish people. They believed that they could be like God. Thus, sin entered the world. And the mission that we now stand in begun right there. So Jesus was on the scene. Wanted to make this very clear. But here, I want you to walk with me in this. Genesis 3. If you pick it up in verse 8. It says, When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? I, I think God's funny. I do, really. I mean, because you can't hide from God, but he allowed us to know that he was desiring what? A relationship. A relationship with Adam and Eve. Where are you? I wanted more for you. And they hid from him. They took those choices that were given to them, and they didn't do so well with those choices. So how do we? Are we so much different than Adam and Eve? We can blame them, point the finger, as we always do. Somebody else made me mad. Somebody else made me angry. Somebody else made me cheat on my wife. Somebody else, and we blame everybody else but ourselves for our actions. So how do we handle our life choices? Are we too running and hiding from God as if we can do that? Because we know we can't. This is not a game of hide and seek from God. What this is really about is finding God, finding our place in his plan, and finding Christ and truly understanding the true life that we can have through Jesus. That's what it's about. Now, you would think that all these incredible prophecies that were made of Jesus, this coming Messiah, you would believe that all the people that experienced God firsthand, these encounters with God in those early days, would set the tone for all of us to say, man, I gotta know this Jesus. I gotta know this God. I've seen what he's done. But life happens, doesn't it? We get busy, we get distracted, and we're not opposed to God being in our lives. We're not opposed to Jesus bringing something to us that is good. But life does get a little busy at times, and we often lose our understanding and our focus of what this life is really about. So how does Jesus get our attention? How does Jesus get us to change our course of life? Especially when our course of life is not so bad. We figured out a few things along the way. And then God shows up and says, I want, to, I want you to change it. And we say, really, God, I just arrived in a moment of peace. And now you want me to change it. Well, let's think about this call that Jesus gives. You can ignore it and say, it's not for me. You can say, well, surely that call of Jesus, is, it's, it's for those special people, right? It's, it's for the educated, the elite, the successful. No, the call that Jesus is giving is for all. And it's interesting that when you see Jesus in his ministry here on earth, 
He didn't start with those people. He started with the common, the despised, the rejected, the questionable. And he started with them. And he says, I'm going to change the world through you. Now, it's interesting to me because I wouldn't have done it that way. I wouldn't have started with the questionable, the despised, or the common. But thank God, I am not the Son of God making those choices. For he is perfect in his ways. But think about this. When, when he looked at this, and he began calling out his disciples, his followers, to move the church for, forward, he could have picked anybody. But he started with the common, didn't he? I mean, it was this day that it was, he was standing amongst many, but yet here were these fishermen. I mean, this was their livelihood. Surely they know how to fish, right, Dan? They should know this. But yet they're coming up empty. Their nets are empty. They're washing them out long night, and they're just discouraged, done. And we find Jesus. He steps into the boat. He begins to continue to talk to the people, but yet to them also. And he encourages them, say, I know you've had a long night, an empty nets, go out a little further. Drop your nets on the other side. Now, the thing I love about Jesus is he has a way of convincing us to do things that we would otherwise not do. They're like, okay, why not? So they did it, didn't they? And when they took those nets out and they dropped them down, we know what the word tells us. Those nets were filled to overflowing to the point that it was dragging the boat down. That was a moment, that was an encounter where they really understood Jesus is not just another man. Maybe he is who he says he is, the son of God. Has Jesus ever got your attention this way? He did in that moment. And I want to read to you. Turn with me to Luke. If we look at Luke chapter 5, we're going to pick it up in verse, verse 8. It says, when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, oh Lord. Please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the number of fish that they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, and the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. That's odd. Why would he say that? It caught them funny, but yet it caught them in their moment. But he didn't end there in, in the calling. If, if we look over just a little bit further in verse 27, Jesus makes this call into this mission to a tax collector. They didn't like him then, and we don't like him today. It's just the way it is. They're messing with our money, all right? Get out of my life. But this, this one in particular, Levi, which we know him as Matthew, was doing what he's always done collected what probably wasn't his to collect. But here he was. In verse 27, it says, Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting in his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. Interesting that he just showed up and was bold enough to ask him, Follow me. I don't care what you've been doing. Come follow me. And it's interesting as we look at the context of his calling at the beginning. It wasn't just for the 12, but we can look at a few of them. I mean, you think of Simon the Zealot. Why would he call him? This guy was engaged in politics, anarchy, trying to overrule the Roman government. Yeah, I want him on my team. But Jesus did. And then we can look at the person of Judas. We don't know a lot about him, but he was that questionable character. We know that he was one that was on the edge of wanting to take for himself. He's the one that betrayed Jesus. Questionable. But he didn't stop just with those 12. He continued to invite in every walk of life. We see Luke, who was a doctor. He ended up being a great evangelist. He wrote the book of Luke and Acts. God used him in a powerful way. But the thing I want you to see is that wherever Jesus finds you, I don't care if it's in a bar or on the assembly line. He wants to know, are you ready to hear what I have to say? Are you tired? Are you empty? Are you frustrated? Are you just taking a moment in life to ponder, is this really what life is all about? 
in those moments, Jesus wants to show up in your life. He wants to give you an invitation. And the invitation is this. Follow me and see what your life can be. Simple request, right? But it has a lot of implications, doesn't it? You know, we look at these things and we try to understand how would we respond. Second point here. What was your response when Jesus called you to follow? Maybe you remember that day when you knew that Jesus was calling you into this mission. Did you ignore it? <laughs> or did you embrace it? Or maybe somewhere in the middle you found yourself. But what about these guys? The request was given. I mean, fishermen, tax collector, that was their livelihood. And he says, leave it behind, follow me. What was their response? Well, if we go back to Luke, we see verse 11. Do you want the fishermen, 511? It says, as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. How can that be? How can somebody just leave everything and follow? How can somebody be that convicted in such a short moment to do this? Now you look at the tax collector, Matthew. We pick it up in verse 28. And it simply says, so Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. We believe this is truth, do we not? Then we know that that's exactly how it happened. I don't understand it. I could see myself just saying, you know what, we're done. Leave it all behind. Don't even care what happens to it. I'm going. I'm leaving. I'm following. But that's what these men did. In fact, it was interesting with Levi. He was so excited about this call. He was so excited. Maybe he didn't like his job. I don't know. But he was excited, and he had a banquet. He had other tax collectors come in. They were having a great time celebrating what his new life call was. But then you have these Pharisees, these religious teachers, the ones that you would think would understand this message. They would pull some of those disciples aside and say, why? Why are you eating with the tax collectors? Why are you hanging out with sinners? I love the NLT. You know what it says, the translation? Why are you eating with the scum? That's what it says. Why are you eating with the scum? These Pharisees did not see themselves as sinners. They didn't see themselves as the scum of the earth. That was everybody else. They were asking that question. Not everybody is going to believe you when you tell them that your heart has been given to Jesus and that you're going to follow him, that you're going to change your career, you're going to give up this, that, or the other. They may say, you're crazy. I don't understand this. But when Jesus gets a hold of our lives, he radically changes it. But if we miss his mission, we won't be able to make that kind of a change. In verse 31, I want to read this to you. It says, Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. That was his response to this religious leaders. He says, we are to go and bring this message of hope to lost is what he wanted us to see. Now, it's easy to think about this pursuit of the lost. We know that's part of the mission. It's part of the Great Commission. And, you know, maybe some will respond to Jesus. And, you know, some people have responded to Jesus. You know why? Because they've tried everything else. I've tried everything else. Why not Jesus? I'll give it a shot. And you know what? Jesus can take that. He says, I can use that. He doesn't care how you come to him. He just wants to make sure that you come and you stay with him. That's what he wants. But what about those people that have, in our eyes, their life figured out? They've come into their own. Their life plan is coming into focus. They get all these things lined up. Their family is where they want it. Their career is where they want it. Their bank account's where they want it. And Jesus says, leave everything and follow me. Excuse me? Jesus, do you realize how hard I've worked to get here? Finally, I can breathe. Finally, I'm not living from check to check, and you're telling me to change my life? Jesus, can you, can you ask it a different way? That's what we say sometimes. And we miss this mark. Now, did Jesus deal with these folks? He did, and he still does. In Matthew 19, we have this account where someone came to Jesus. And hearing this message, they said, oh, I want this thing that you're talking about. I want eternal life. I want to have this in my life. How can I add it to my family profile? How can I add this to my life? Fit it in. I'll make space for it. Just tell me how I get it. Well, 
Jesus kind of lays it out this way. In Matthew 19, we want to pick it up in verse 21. Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to the disciples, I tell you the truth. It is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I didn't say that he's opposed for us to have things. But he is opposed to those things controlling us. Those things becoming our idol. Those things becoming our motive in getting up every day of our lives to gather more of the things that mean nothing. Zero. You cannot take it with you. And we have to understand the message of salvation has to be the priority in our lives. And this individual went away sad. Why? Because he didn't want to change. He didn't want to understand. Now, maybe some of us would be kind of in that line to say, okay, Jesus, let's make a deal. Well, one, you don't make a deal with Jesus, all right? But we try anyway. We, we go down this path and say, well, maybe um, when I get my life a little further down the road, I'll, I'll commit more of my time to you, Jesus. Maybe when my children are grown, because surely you want me to make sure that's my priority, Jesus. Maybe when my career is over, maybe when I have less stress, then I can step into your mission. What was your first response when Jesus called you? And what is your response today? Every day we have to answer that question. Whom will I serve? Whom will I give my life to? But be assured of this, whatever choice you make, when you take that last breath, you will stand before God. And he will ask, what did you do with my son? How did he change your life? Did you share that message with anyone? We will have to answer for that. But let's just take a few moments here to discover what it really looks like to step into his mission. Now, this third point, all right, there's kind of a trick here. What does it look like to step into your mission? Now, the trick is this, the word your. And why I put it in there is because that's how we often have to approach our society. We have to go after your heart's desire. We have to get you to buy in. What's your mission rather than what's God's mission for me? So what has to happen here first is we have to have a change of ownership. We have to begin to realize that when I give my life to Jesus, I no longer own my life. I have given it back to him. He rules and reigns in my life. And I will follow his lead, not mine. But that's where it gets difficult sometimes for us, is to make that shift, to step into that mission. Because God's mission is often very different than what we would paint a picture for our own life. I mean, last week we had the opportunity to learn a little bit more about Moses. He stepped into that mission. God made it his to lead the people out of Egypt. He became kind of that spiritual father figure for the people of Israel. And he did a pretty good job. But then he passed it on, didn't he? Because he died. He passed it on to Joshua. And Joshua became that spiritual leader, father figure for the people of Israel. But when he stepped into that, he didn't see it as his role, his mission, until God showed him that it was his mission. Joshua probably didn't want it, as many of us don't want the mission that God gives to us. But he's not going to give you something that he doesn't believe that you can see through, that you can walk through with his ability, with his provision. So are we willing to step into that? These are the questions that we have to ask. Now, it can be scary. Uh, trust me, it can be very intimidating. God put it on my heart to start a church. Right. But here we are today. And he's done an incredible thing. Not because of anything I have done. The only thing I did was, Lord, fine, I'll go. And I stepped into it. And he showed me every step of the way. But when you look at this, what's in those steps? 
Well, for Joshua, we want to look at this in Joshua for just a moment. Joshua 1, 7 through 9. It says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you'll be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all that you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So though Joshua was called into this mission, God gave him expectations of what he desired from him in preparation for the mission. But what else did he give him? Promise. I will always be with you. I will always provide for you. So fear not by stepping in. Trust me in this. And the beautiful thing in, in Joshua's life is that when he stepped into that mission, guess what happened? Others followed. There's an incredible thing that happens. It's called a contagious spirit. A contagious spirit of faith. When one brother or sister sees another step into a mission, when it doesn't have the clarity that we would want, and we see God show up and show up and show up, eventually somebody says, I want to step too. I want to know God in this way. And Joshua was able to inspire many others to follow that lead. But the challenge in stepping towards God is this, is stepping away from your desires and your thoughts, and trusting God's. In Isaiah, this is a beautiful truth that we have to understand. In Isaiah 55, 8, it says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Now, maybe we've heard this along the way. And maybe we can identify with that and say, yes, God is above me. I don't always understand him. I get that. But many people reach a point, even in this, they say, okay, I know your ways are different than mine. But if you're asking me to step into this mission, God, um, what's in it for me? Am I wrong? No, we ask, what's in it for me? I mean, you're asking me to step away from my life mission, God and step into yours, what do I get out of this? Jesus, sell me on this. Otherwise, we're probably not going to agree on this. You see that battle that we can have in the flesh? It happens all too often. But you know what? He does tell us what we get. Do you want to hear what we get when we step into the mission? Well, I'm going to share it with you. We go back to Luke chapter 6. He's dealing with the, the disciples that he's calling into the mission. He's going to let them know, this is what you get. If you buy into this, if you walk with me, you follow me, this is what you get. Listen to this. Luke chapter 6, verse 22. What blessings await you when people hate you and exclude you and mock you and curse you as evil because you follow the Son of Man? When this happens, be happy. Right? Yes, leap for joy, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, their ancestors treated the ancient prophets the same way. And you're sitting there going, that's what I get? That's what I get by stepping in? Sign me up, please. I cannot wait. And, and see, they probably felt the same way. What I get is I get cursed at? That's what I get by following you? I thought it was going to be better than this. I thought it was bigger than this. It is. But it comes through surrender. The world needs to know that you're willing to die for this. If you're not willing to die for the message of Christ, then how can it change the world? It becomes just another belief system amongst many. But the one that you will die for will cause people to stop and say, I wonder if what they're saying is real. If they're willing to die for it. At least it allows the question to be asked. But then he doesn't stop there. He goes on in describing these things of, of what you get. In Luke chapter 9, he's getting ready to send the, the 12 out. So he kind of lays this out already. 
And he says, oh, no, wait, there's more. You get more. Just hang on here, folks. And then we reach chapter 9. And it says, one day Jesus called together his 12 disciples and gave them power and authority to cast out all the demons and to heal all diseases. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now this gets exciting. I mean, now, now you're talking, I get to do something. You know, I've always liked Superman and all the powers that come with him. And, you know, as growing up, instead of going, all right, if I get to do some things that are supernatural, this is kind of cool stuff. Maybe I'm in. Maybe I'm in. But listen to what it also says here. In verse 3, it says, take nothing for your journeys, ladies. He instructed them. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> Don't take a walking stick, a traveling bag, food, money, or even lipstick or a change of clothes. I added that. <laughs> Whenever you go, stay in the same house until you leave town. And if a town refuses to welcome you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their own fate. So they began their circuit of the villages preaching the good news and healing the sick. They actually bought into this. Jesus actually convinced them to go and to not take anything. Can you imagine the conversations amongst friends and families? Sitting there going, uh, really, you're doing this? You're, you're leaving your career? You're leaving your family to follow who? Jesus? Yeah, I am. Can you imagine what that was like? I'm sure there was tension in the home for many that followed Jesus. But today, we don't want that tension we don't want that point. Now, I can look at this, and I can say, you know what? I get it. Maybe some would follow Jesus with the promises of being able to do some of these cool things. Maybe it could woo a few. But what about the rest? What about just all the rest that are along the journey? What's the appeal of following Jesus if all I get is nothingness, as we see it? There's no earthly assurance. There's no provision that I see. You're just telling me to go. And trust you. Right. But many did. Because many believed that Jesus was enough. Church, do we believe that Jesus is enough? We've got to get there. We've got to begin to understand this truth. Now in Luke, we look at uh, verse 57. In verse 57, what it tells us is this. As many were following, it says, As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. It goes on to talk about, well, let me go first bury my father. Uh, let me go say goodbye to my family. That's what the scripture says. And Jesus is basically saying, I I'm it. Are you in? Follow me. Now, you may say, that, man, this is harsh. Really, this is what I get in the call of Jesus? I think there's a lesson to be learned here for sure. And the lesson to be learned is stop with the excuses. Stop with the excuses of why you can't follow Jesus. And be honest with why you won't follow Jesus. And begin to make the shift and understand the opportunity. It's not that he didn't care that somebody had died in your family. It's not that Jesus didn't care that you wanted to say goodbye to your family. What Jesus cared about is that you would take him into those moments if it's about burying somebody, take Jesus and put him at the center. If it's about saying goodbye to somebody, put Jesus at the center. Let the world know why you do what you do. Believe as you do. Jesus wants to be at the center of all of it. You know, Christ's mission has to be the priority in our lives. Every day, every moment of our life, whether at home or at work, has to be seen as the mission field of Christ. Has to. Every circumstance in our lives, hear me this. Listen, every circumstance in our lives has an opportunity to be about us or be about Christ in us. Did you hear me? Every circumstance in our lives has the opportunity to be about us or to be about Christ in us. We have to choose. Now, you don't have to make the right choice. You have that freedom. But you do have to answer for the choices that you do make that day that we stand before him. But he wants so much more for us. When we begin to see life through the eyes of Jesus and begin to see his mission, it becomes our mission. 
And we don't have to choose anymore. My way or his way. It's our way. Because we're surrendered in our spirit to him. I want to invite you to come back next week as we finish up this series. And next week we're going to be talking about your story. Because everyone has one. Your story in his mission. You want to come back next week and hear about this. But we have to also understand that there's going to be a question. Are you willing to share your story? And are you willing to step into his mission? Let's pray. Father, we've seen your hand move today. We've seen your heart today. And Father, it's not easy to step into your mission until we make it our mission. That battle of the flesh is always going to be there until we surrender the flesh to you. So Father, today, there's no better day than today to live out our salvation for you, to live in that truth for others. So Father, I pray that we would see the beauty of this call, that we wouldn't have the excuses, but we would say, Jesus, why not me? Why not now? Give us the boldness and the courage to step out. Even when everybody else says, you're a fool. Well, then I'm a fool for Jesus. And I will go where he shows me I should go. Father, give us that radical change in our lives. We played it too comfortable for too long. Lord, give us a faith that shakes the very foundation of which we stand upon. So the world will take notice that Jesus is alive and well in the hearts of his people. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.